When I was growing up, I was fascinated by Greek mythology. So I read a lot of stories. And uh, one of the stories that captured my attention was about someone named Tantalus, who for some reason, which I can't remember, he was cursed to stand um, chest deep in a pool of water. And he the curse was that no matter how thirsty he got, every time he bent down to try and drink the water, the water level would go down. So he was forever where the water was, but he could never drink it. And so uh, from that story, we get the English word tantalize, something that attracts you. Um, And the, the sense of that word is often the idea that something is an offer, but it's hard to actually grasp it. Um, There's something out there that looks good if you could only get to it. Um, And one of the frustrations that we face in life that the Bible acknowledges is that uh, we're looking for satisfaction and many of the things or circumstances that we assume would bring us satisfaction seem just out of our reach, no matter how hard we try, no matter what we do. But there's another kind of frustration that the Bible also talks about, and that is the frustration that we will actually grasp the thing that we're striving and reaching for only to find that it doesn't satisfy us after all. And there is another danger that we won't talk a lot about tonight. The other danger is that we would grasp what we're reaching for Mm -hmm. And we would feel satisfied only to come to the end of our life and enter eternity realizing that we were finding satisfaction in something that wouldn't truly last. So what are you looking to for satisfaction? Where are you looking for satisfaction? Are you in a situation where you feel like you're reaching for that thing, that situation that might bring you satisfaction and you can't quite get it and your life is frustrated? Or maybe you're in a situation where you uh, have gotten something that you thought would bring you satisfaction and you're realizing that you're coming up empty. Jesus had a conversation with a woman who was thirsty So Jesus talked to her about water that quenches thirst forever. True satisfaction. So I want us to look at this conversation together tonight in John chapter 4. John chapter 4. We refer to this woman as the woman at the well because that's where Jesus met her. We want to listen in on this conversation because the Lord has left it for us in the Bible for our benefit because we, while we may not make the same life choices that this woman made, uh, we face the same problem and the same temptation, and that is to look for satisfaction in something or someone other than God. We may try to satisfy our desires in sinful ways, We may try to satisfy them in ways that aren't necessarily sinful, but the fact that we're looking to something or someone other than God for satisfaction, the Bible tells tells us, is in itself sinful. And connected with that is another problem, and that is that if we're concerned about our relationship with God at all, if we're not looking to our relationship with God to bring satisfaction, then we're often satisfied with the mistaken idea that our relationship with God is something superficial. As long as things on the outside look good, then that's good enough. And we're reluctant to actually deal with our sinful heart. Even we as Christians, even those of us who are giving our lives to serve the Lord, we may actually get preoccupied with busy things in life and we might miss what God is trying to do or neglect the work God is giving us because maybe the work that we're doing for the Lord has become our source of satisfaction rather than the Lord himself. So let's look at John chapter 4 and follow this conversation. Um, Chapter 4 begins by actually setting the stage, getting Jesus to the right place. Um, In John chapter 3, Jesus was in Jerusalem. 
He had a conversation with Nicodemus and then he left Jerusalem and was in the area of Judah, the area around Jerusalem. And uh, so we're picking up in verse 1 with the Lord moving from the area of Judea um, to go somewhere else. Therefore, that when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And we'll stop our reading there and just work our way through this conversation. Jesus has approached this conversation through leaving Judea, because there's the beginning of uh, or a development in the hostility between the Jewish leaders and Jesus. So Jesus is leaving Judea, which is uh, in the southern part of Israel. He's going to Galilee, which is in the northern part. And in the center, uh, there is an area called Samaria. Um, At that time, it was called Samaria, and the people were called Samaritans. And there's a long history of who those people were and why the Jewish people and the Samaritans didn't get along. To just summarize that history, in 2 Kings 17 and 18, we read the record of the defeat of the northern kingdom. Um, Israel had divided into two nations, the southern kingdom Judah, the northern kingdom Israel. The northern kingdom Israel is defeated by another country, the country of Assyria, and they kill many of the people and they deport many of the people to other places and to kind of scatter people around to keep uh, resistance from rising up to their rule. They move people from Israel to other places and move people from other places into Israel. So what you end up having uh, living in that area is a group that is a mixture as far as their ethnic heritage, a mixture of um, Jewish people and other peoples. And their religious practices and beliefs also became somewhat mixed. There was a core of uh, what we would call Judaism, but they had the Old Testament heritage, but that had been mixed with uh, many other ideas. And of course, the nation of Israel, the reason for their defeat was that they had been unfaithful to God and refused to obey 
uh, what they had in what we call the Old Testament. So uh, they were starting, any of those who were left there were starting from a really, really weak position as far as really knowing God and his word. And now that's diluted even further by people from other areas. So uh, it turns out um, that from what we can tell, the Samaritans claimed to believe in the one true God and they accepted um, the books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible. Um, so that was the focus of their beliefs from what we can tell at the time of Jesus. So for the Jewish people, they would view the Samaritans as not part of us. You're not part of us. You don't know the Lord. You don't have God's word. And then, of course, from the Samaritan people's perspective, we're the ones with the core of God's word. And so we've, we're the ones who have it right. And the Jews have just added all these other things that we don't accept. So there wasn't um, good relationship. And some people have suggested that this statement is really unusual when we're told that Jesus needed to go through Samaria. Um, and some people believe that many of the Jewish people, when they were traveling between Galilee and Judea, especially to go to Jerusalem for the festivals, they would actually travel around Samaria rather than go through it. Um, I'm not sure if that's true. I'm not sure if everybody did that. I can certainly imagine Jewish people deciding that they would rather go through Samaria than take the time and trouble to go all the way around. Um, so Jesus might have been saying, um, I have to go somewhere that you wouldn't expect me to go. Um, or he might just be saying, um, that this is the most direct route. This is where Jesus planned to go the way from Jerusalem, Judea, up to Galilee, he's got to go through Samaria. Uh, whether John, the author, intends to make a big point on that, we're not sure. He doesn't elaborate on that. But it is helpful and important for us to realize the tension that existed and the disagreement and differences because some of those are going to play a part in the conversation that Jesus has that we just read. Jesus uh, stops in this village. His disciples go to buy food, and he's sitting there by the well, um, outside of the town, and that's probably a reflection of the not good relationships. But then as a woman approaches to draw water, we see that Jesus, while he hadn't entered the village, he actually is willing to engage in conversation with Samaritan people. Jesus asked this woman for water, which surprises her. And from her response, it sounds like her surprise is due to the fact that he's Jewish and she's Samaritan, and he's a man, and she's a woman that he doesn't know. So at the social level, um, whether there's any ethnic prejudice going on here or um, however their society handled relationships between men and women, she's surprised that Jesus, this Jewish man um, sitting by the well, is willing to engage in conversation with the Samaritan woman that he's never met before. But Jesus has engaged her in conversation and Jesus' response to her is really, really interesting. Look back at verse 10. If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. It's like Jesus' response is saying, you're surprised that I'm talking to you. And your surprise is due to the fact that you're Samaritan and I'm Jewish and it's strange that I would um, and initiate this conversation with you. But actually, if you realized who I am, you would still be surprised, but you'd be surprised about something else. You'd be surprised that I'm asking you for water when, in fact, I'm the one who gives water. And we'll notice through this conversation that Jesus uses a, a word that allows him to make a play on words. He uses the term living water that for them would have referred to running water, water that wasn't still like in a well. So the water in a river would be living water. It's running water. But of course, as we um, think through the conversation and know where it's going, we realize that Jesus is leading this woman to realize that he's using that expression, but he's not talking about physical, literal water. He's talking about what we might call the water of life. He's talking about this idea of water as a, a picture of the life that Jesus offers to people, eternal life, life with God. 
So Jesus takes advantage of this woman's approach. Um, he sees this as an opportunity for him to um, for him to engage this woman in conversation about life and death and about his own identity. So Jesus asks for water. The woman's surprised, and Jesus is starting to hint that he's not exactly who he appears to be. He's much, much more. And of course, Jesus acknowledges that she couldn't have actually known that. To all appearances, Jesus is just a Jewish man. So Jesus isn't scolding her for not realizing this. There's no way she could have known. Jesus is using this situation to raise an issue that she needs to hear about. Jesus knows this woman. He knows her much more thoroughly than we would expect. But Jesus knows that this woman, even though she's not a Jew, she needs to hear this message also. So Jesus takes this opportunity to raise this really important issue of living water that he's using as a metaphor for life. This woman needs life. Jesus is the one who can provide life. And of course, she doesn't realize who he is and exactly what he offers. And at this point, we'll find that she does not realize her deep need for what Jesus offers. And of course, she doesn't even realize at the beginning that Jesus is talking about something other than literal physical water. And you can see that in verse 11 when she replies, you don't have anything to draw with and the well is deep. Where are you going to get water? I'm the one with all the tools. I'm the one with the resources. What kind of water are you going to give me? And then in verse 12, uh, a statement that actually took me a long while to really understand I, what I think she's getting at. Um, are you greater than our father Jacob? What she's talking about. Uh, this is Jacob's well. They look back in their history and um, Jacob has dug this well and it's still there. There's still water and they're using this well and they're looking back and revering Jacob. They're looking to him for his example of trusting God. And um, so they looked to him as this leader. And here's this Jewish man. She doesn't know him from anyone. And he comes up and he's offering living water. And it's like she's looking around and she's thinking, I'm the one with the stuff to get water out of the well. And there's nowhere else to get water. There's no river here. If there was a river here, if there was flowing water nearby, why in the world would Jacob have dug the well? So what makes you so great that you could do something Jacob couldn't even do? He dug the well. How are you going to get some kind of running water out here? If Jacob couldn't find it, you're not going to find it. So how is Jesus going to provide anything that this woman needs? she actually considers herself in a position to be the one who can provide something Jesus needs. And at the physical level, that's true. But Jesus answers in verse 13, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And it's really clear at this point that Jesus is not talking about physical water that you need to drink to satisfy your thirst and keep your body alive. And the woman isn't, isn't really grasping what Jesus is saying when he challenges her to realize that the water that they can get from the well will... Physic will quench her physical thirst temporarily, but we all know what it is to, to drink water and we don't just drink water once and then we're done. We keep drinking water our whole life. Jesus is offering a permanent supply of water that satisfies and sustains eternal life. And using water as a metaphor for life with God is not new to God's people. God has used that image often in the Old Testament. For example, in Jeremiah chapter 2, God sends the prophet Jeremiah to challenge the people and rebuke them because they have this amazing source of, of clean, living water. And 
they're turning away from this clean, fresh water to dig out, hollow out in the rock uh, a cistern, a kind of a bowl, a little reservoir that will hold some water when it rains, and then it will sit there and it will slowly dry up and what's left will get stagnant and maybe it's muddy. But they're going to prefer that to the clean, fresh water that God provides for them. And that's the image that God uses to talk to his people about how foolish, really, really foolish it is for them to turn away from a true living God who actually exists, who can actually hear prayer, who can actually um, help them, and who offers them satisfaction in himself as their creator. And they turn away from him, and they go and they make for themselves other gods. They make up gods. They worship spirits. They create these little idols and they're going to give their devotion and their praise and they're going to look for satisfaction in those things that can never provide it. And as you read through the Old Testament, you also find God using this image of water in terms of God's future plans. When the Messiah comes and the Messianic age arrives, a time of blessing, it's going to be like God is pouring out. And he even talks about um, pouring out a water in terms of sending his spirit to an anticipate and begin the Messianic age. So you have this idea of, of water and it's being used to talk about life with God. And the life that God offers. That's actually what Jesus is offering to this woman. He's offering her life with God. And she agrees with him in verse 15, but she still isn't grasping what Jesus is getting at because she says, hey, I want that water. That sounds great. I don't want to be thirsty again. I don't want to have to keep coming to this well all the time. This sounds really good. Sign me up. So then Jesus needs to take this conversation to a deeper level by confronting this woman. And it's important to grasp something that I think is relevant for our efforts to share the gospel with people. That you can give people God's word and if you stay at a surface level, even if people understand what you're talking about, that you're talking about um, life with God rather than physical water, say, um, everything sounds really good and they're ready to accept that as long as it stays on the surface. But we're going to watch Jesus go below the surface to confront something going on in her heart because we're not talking about physical thirst and the satisfaction of drinking physical water we're talking about life with god and if you want the satisfaction of life with god then you have to go below the surface and talk about your heart because that's what god cares about how does jesus challenge this woman he makes what might seem like a really strange request. Verse 16, go call your husband and come here. And the woman has to admit that she isn't married right now, um, which is not a problem except for her situation. It's not that she's never been with a man, it's that she has this whole history of of different men that she's been with. She's been married five times, and now she's with someone else that she's not married to. And we could focus on the sinful activities that this woman is engaged in. Jesus seems to not really press her directly about why that's wrong. It seems like what Jesus presses her on is not the sinfulness of the activity that she's looking to satisfy her thirst. He pushes on the very fact that she's looking to satisfy her thirst. She's thirsty and she's not getting satisfied. She's looking in the wrong place to quench her thirst. So, 
Jesus tells her, call your husband. And she says, well, I don't have a husband. And then Jesus responds with knowledge that a normal person wouldn't have. Well, you're right. You don't have a husband. And Jesus reveals that he knows this woman's past. And it's a past of thirstiness. She's thirsty. She's looking for satisfaction. And this woman is looking for satisfaction in relationships, human relationships. And this isn't really hard to understand. Even though it sounds like, wow, five times she's been married and now she's divorced again and she's uh, left that husband, the fifth one, and she's with someone else. That sounds like an exaggeration, but it's not hard to understand a kind of person like this who goes in and out of relationships because they're looking for satisfaction and they think, oh, if I just get um, in a relationship with the right person or the right kind of person, then I'll be satisfied. And this seems like the person. And, and then you get into the relationship and it turns out, But it's not. And you, like I, probably know people whose life sounds like this woman's life. I know someone who has gone from one man to another man to another man. And every time she thinks that this is the man who's going to satisfy me, this is the one, he's just wonderful, my life will be great, so we're going to be together And then after a while, she realizes, no, this relationship isn't actually satisfying to me. It's not providing what I thought it would provide. The guy isn't what I thought he was. I'm disappointed. So she breaks up with him, and after not very long, she's with another guy. And the same thing happens. And she leaves these guys, and to her, the problem is men, or the problem is marriage. I'm not going to get married again because the problems come when, when I've gotten married, or Um, It's just so hard to find the right kind of guy. So the problem is there aren't any of the right kind of guy. And all the while, this, this girl is going from relationship to relationship, just like the woman we're reading about. And she's, she's finding, she's looking for something. She's reaching for something that's so elusive because every time she thinks she's got in it, she's disappointed. And what she's not grasping, the same thing that this woman was not grasping to this point in her life, is that she's looking for satisfaction in the wrong place. She's never going to find a human relationship that will satisfy her. She'll always be disappointed. We read about that in Isaiah chapter 55. That too was focused on people... Um, not in their physical relationships, human relationships, but in terms of where they're looking for ultimate satisfaction and who they're looking to for perfection, protection and provision. They're looking to false gods. They're looking to idols. And God is challenging them, uh, actually challenging them by way of using an, an open invitation. If you're thirsty, come here to me. I'm the one who's the source of what can satisfy and quench your thirst and you don't even have to pay for it. And when I read about this woman and when I think about people like her, whether they're trying to find satisfaction in human relationships or work or entertainment, um, I think of the book of Ecclesiastes which challenges us with the frustrating experience we all have in life if we're looking to find satisfaction in this world and in our experiences or the things we can accumulate. We'll always be disappointed. This world and nothing in it will ever satisfy us. So Jesus is using this question and then this revelation that he knows something about her that people wouldn't ordinarily know if they're just meeting her. Jesus uses this point to bring her deeper, to confront her about her heart. And she's not ready for that yet. Verse 19, the woman said, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. She responds to Jesus exposing her situation 
by raising this theological disagreement. And it seems pretty clear that she's not bringing this up right now because she's really concerned to settle this issue. She's bringing this up because it's not personal. We can talk about theological differences all day long and we might feel very strongly about them and we might feel personally attacked when someone disagrees with us about a theological position. But but in a sense, it's more comfortable than talking about what we're doing because it's a step removed from us. So this woman, it seems like she's not ready to talk about her activity. She's not comfortable with that. Probably because she realizes that she's not only looking for satisfaction in the wrong thing, but she's doing it the wrong way. She's doing it by disobeying God. So she's she's not really concerned about what God is pleased with. She's using this as what we might call a kind of red herring to divert attention to something else. So she acknowledges, wow, you must be a prophet. How could you know something like that? So here's this question. Are we supposed to worship here on this mountain where the Samaritans think we should worship based on the first five books of the Bible or is the place of worship in Jerusalem? We have this difference of opinion. And she's using that to distract Jesus from talking to her about herself and her own condition. But Jesus refocuses on the primary issue. 21, he does respond directly to what she says. Believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But then he says it again. The hour is coming and now is when. And he goes on and we'll come back to this in just a moment. But it's like Jesus is saying, well, actually the Jews are right about this. But right now that's actually beside the point. Jesus responds directly to what she said, but then really quickly moves away from that back to refocus the conversation on what this woman needs to hear. Because what she needs to hear is not whether we're supposed to worship in Jerusalem or on Mount Gerizim. What she needs to hear about is how can you actually approach God and have him accept you and why it's important to approach God after all because He created us to find satisfaction in him. And so as long as you look for satisfaction somewhere else, you will always be disappointed. So the question is, what is God looking for? There's no point in debating this right now because it's not what this woman needs. And it's also um, going to be a moot point really soon anyway, because with Jesus's work on the cross, um, God is going to change what he's doing in the world. And so the center of worship, whether it was supposed to be in Jerusalem or at Mount Gerizim, is actually not going to matter any longer. Jesus' followers can worship him anywhere. And that's partly because of what he says in verse 23. um, True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. What God is most concerned about in our worship is not what's on the outside, the external things like the kind of building you go into and the location of that building. God is most concerned about the sincerity of our worship and whether our worship corresponds to God's directions, whether it follows God's directions, whether we're obedient. And that's not to say that things on the outside don't matter at all. But I think we can realize the importance to say that you could completely reject anything God says about any of the externals of worship, and we acknowledge that would be bad. But you could obey all of God's instructions about the externals of worship, and you still wouldn't be the kind of worshiper that God is looking for because he's looking for worshipers who are worshiping him in spirit and in truth, sincerely and according to his word. He's the one who gets to say how we can approach him because we're estranged from him. So Jesus refocuses the attention away from this theological debate right back onto this woman Are you the kind of worshiper that God will accept? And that goes much, much deeper than just what city you think you're supposed to worship in. 
the place you go to worship. It goes right to your heart. And as soon as you start looking at your heart for this woman, it goes right back to exposing her sinfulness, that she's looking for satisfaction in her human relationships rather than in God. And she's not even willing to obey God's word about the kinds of things that are appropriate and acceptable to do. So she's looking for satisfaction in the wrong place and she's doing it the wrong way. And again, the woman deflects um, attention away from her and her personal relationship with God. Verse 25, I know that Messiah is coming who's called Christ. When he comes, he'll tell us all things. It's kind of like she's saying, okay, we're just going to agree to disagree. Even if I concede that that you Jews are right and we should worship in Jerusalem, um, I'm not interested in changing anything right now. I'm just going to wait for the Messiah and he's going to set everything right. So Jesus responds to that with, a statement that's actually much more direct than most of the statements he made to Jewish people about his identity. She's saying, I'm just going to wait for the Messiah. And Jesus replies, verse 26, I am the Messiah. And maybe he's not usually this direct with with the Jewish people because of their incorrect expectations. But now he's very direct with this woman that he's not just a prophet. He is the Messiah. He's the one that she says that she's waiting for who's going to set everything right. And now she has to face the fact that his setting everything right isn't just everything on the outside. Setting things right includes what's inside of me too. Jesus is going to address her problems. And as the Messiah, he intends to rule over her heart, not just her city. And he's going to resolve all of these theological issues and religious questions, not just with externals, not just with addressing questions of where we should worship, but he's going to go right to our hearts of whether God will even accept our worship. That's where we stopped reading. But if you look... Again, now, verse 27, while Jesus is having this conversation, the disciples come. They were out buying food. They uh, they arrive back at the well, and they're surprised that Jesus is talking with a woman, but no one interrupts the conversation, even though they're confused. So while they're standing by wondering what's going on, why is Jesus talking with her? What What is this about? Um, while they're standing there, the woman leaves her water pot, She doesn't take any water back to the city. She's forgotten that errand because she's discovered a source of true living water that actually will quench thirst. She runs into the city and she starts telling people, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And who else could actually already know what's in my heart and claim to be the answer for it? Because Jesus has exposed her thirst And then offered himself as the one, the only one who can quench that thirst. The only one who can give her life with God. So the woman goes into the city and as a result of her talking to people about what she's seen in Jesus, the people of the city are ready to come with her out to to see Jesus. But while she's gone, Jesus has another conversation, this one with his disciples. In the meantime, verse 31, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat, which you do not know. Therefore, the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do not say there are still, um, do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. And then we jump back to the Samaritan people coming out 
um, and they have a conversation with Jesus and they urge him to stay there. He ends up staying there two days and verse 41, many more believed because of his own word. And then they actually say to the woman, first we were believing because of what you told us and now we have our own firsthand experience and now we're believing based on our own uh, interaction with Jesus. But when the disciples come and they have their conversation with Jesus, uh, they're concerned and confused about Jesus' hunger. They went to buy food and they come back and they're urging Jesus to eat, but he's saying that he doesn't actually need to eat right now. He has, or at least that's what it sounds like. That's how the disciples take it. Well, wait a minute. Who gave him food? Where did he get food from? Did this woman give him something to eat? And Jesus, again, is using food as a, as a metaphor. He's not saying that he's no longer physically hungry, although we can also understand how when you get busy with something, uh, the, sometimes you just don't feel hunger for a while and then you finish and, wow, I'm ravenous. But Jesus then uses this metaphor because the disciples are concerned about food. Jesus uses this metaphor to raise the, actually the same issue with them that he was just talking with the woman about. I have food that you don't know about. And then Jesus clarifies, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. My satisfaction, my source of satisfaction is found in my relationship with God and in my doing um, what he calls me to do, what he gives me to do. This is my food. My satisfaction is in God. Or you could say it this way, what is satisfying to me and what is necessary for my life is knowing and serving God. And that's actually how the book of Ecclesiastes ends. This is human life. To fear God and to keep his commands. To know God and to serve him. And it's also true that in the Old Testament, we have find statements like in Deuteronomy 8.3, the suggestion that God's word or obeying God is more important than food. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus talks about prioritizing pleasing God. You make pleasing God the most important thing and let God worry about providing you the food that you need. You don't need to be anxious about that. So Jesus is focusing his disciples' attention on the significance of, of what he's doing. But before he does that, we're going to look at that in just a moment, but before he does that, he, he brings their attention back to this point, the same point that he made for the woman, that satisfaction is found in knowing and serving God. Jesus, um, we could say Jesus mediates the satisfying, life-giving relationship with God that God wants us to have with him. Then Jesus goes on to talk about the significant significance of what's happening right now. He talks to them about the harvest. Like, look, there's already a harvest here. And then he talks about different people have different responsibilities. And some people plant and there are these different responsibilities going on. And he ends by saying that um, you're going to reap that for which you've not labored. So other people have labored and now you're... and you're coming in and you're having a part in that. And what he seems to be doing is is helping them to realize the significance of what is happening with his arrival and his identity as the Messiah. If Jesus is the Messiah and the Messiah has arrived, then what they're going to see and what they're experiencing is actually the initial stages of what they would have looked at in the Old Testament and considered to be the Messianic age. And of course, Jesus is going to have to help them understand as they go along that they're not going to immediately experience all of those blessings that God has talked about. So there's something that that isn't coming yet, but at the same time, for part of it, the, the initiation of it, the time is now. And the harvest that he's talking about is people responding to Jesus. So these disciples have the unique blessing of following this long, long, long preparation. 
of God working with people, sending his word through prophets. All of these people for years and years and years have labored and labored. And now Jesus' disciples, they get to be the ones to be there to see the beginning of the harvest. As the Messiah comes and people start recognizing him as the Messiah and responding to him with faith, they get to be a part of that. It's a huge, huge privilege. And one that could bring a lot of satisfaction. But I think that part of what Jesus is getting at by prefacing it by by this idea that he's finding his food, his satisfaction in in knowing and serving the Father is not only to not get distracted by other things going around them, physical needs and the business of life, but also that we could fall into the trap of of doing God's work but disconnecting that from God himself. So the problem is, as we've been saying over and over, we look for satisfaction in something or someone other than God. We may try to satisfy our desires in sinful ways, like the woman who is seeking satisfaction in physical relationships with people or emotional relationships with people. We see a reflection of Israel. They're always leaving God and they're never satisfied. They're not satisfied with what God is doing for them and they're always um, going um, and looking to uh, other gods to provide them with what they need and what they want. And even Jesus' followers might mistakenly think that what's really important to God is religious activities and we avoid dealing with our sinful heart. And what can happen is that we do things on the outside, everything might look good, we look like we're following the Lord, but we're still, we still have the problem, we're still looking for satisfaction somewhere else. But God wants to go right to our heart and pull us back to himself by offering us this living water in Jesus. So the message here is that the Messiah has arrived in the person of Jesus. We see Jesus saying the hour's coming and now is. I'm the one. It's already the harvest that's anticipated by the Old Testament. And Jesus, as the Messiah, knows and can authoritatively say what God wants. And he also knows what's in my heart. And he knows all about my life. And this Messiah offers and then models by his relationship with the father he offers and models satisfaction with god he himself is what we need in other words what jesus comes to offer is not rules for us to follow it's not rituals or ceremonies for us to participate in jesus is offering himself this person is the one that we need who gives life with god the father But while he offers what we need, at the same time, he requires in order for us to take this offer and take advantage of it and actually benefit from it, he requires that we repent of our attempts to find satisfaction in something else and prioritize serving the God who gives us life. So, To respond to that message, we need to realize that what Jesus is calling us to is not something that's just on the surface of acknowledging certain facts, but allowing him to change the kind of person we are. Jesus is offering to restore us to to become the right kind of person to be the kind of person who it's like we have this well of water flowing up inside of us. And it's not just that we're no longer thirsty. We're not running around looking for satisfaction in these experiences or relationships, but we actually have something that flows out of our life. It affects every part of our life and even influences people around us. as we allow him to restore us to the kind of person who looks to God for satisfaction and can find satisfaction in a relationship with God, even though 
it's still limited. We're not experiencing everything that Jesus offers because some of that's still in the future and our life is still full of of so many frustrations. But the point is we keep turning back to God. We keep turning back to God because we acknowledge that he's the only source of satisfaction. And anything else, as the Old Testament tells over and over, anything else will ultimately disappoint us. So here are some questions for you. Are you thirsty? If you are thirsty, where are you looking to quench your thirst? What are you doing to find satisfaction? Here's another question for you. Are you assuming or living like God only cares about the outside? That as long as you have this aspect of your life and everything looks good, then you can just, in your heart, you can just kind of do what you want. And that's not even to say you you disobey God all the time in every way or that you do all sorts of bad things. It's just that you're doing what you want. And at the level of your heart, your relationship with God is really superficial because you're not actually very concerned about what he wants. And you're so distracted from that relationship because the relationship with God isn't what you're expecting to find satisfaction from. So you're, you're distracted from the relationship because you're looking other places. Does your worship reach your heart? Not even just in the moment of a worship service, but in your life. And here's another question. Are you preoccupied with all the things going on in your life? Or are you consciously making an effort to prioritize God's will for you? It's even possible to focus so much on the service that we're doing that we neglect our relationship with the one that we're serving. So we have this problem. We all have this problem. And Jesus is offering himself as the answer to this problem. We're all thirsty people. We can't avoid that. So the question is, will we look to Jesus to quench our thirst? Or will we keep looking somewhere else that is actually bound to disappoint us? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus' offer that we can listen in on this conversation and see Jesus offering himself as as uh, the source of life and satisfaction of having a relationship with you restored. Father, we pray that uh, anyone who is here who doesn't know you through Jesus will receive the life that Jesus offers and be willing to turn away from Uh, anything else that they have been trusting in. But, Father, we pray also that those of us who are your people, we ask that you will deliver us from looking for satisfaction in something or someone other than you. It's so easy for us to do that. We find ourselves doing it all the time. We pray that by your grace we will be quick to repent and turn to you, not just superficially, but in our hearts worship you because we believe that you are creator. You are the one who is the source of everything good. And you made us for a relationship with you. So the relationship with you is uh, ought to be a priority for us. We ask that you'll help us to respond with faith and be willing to make the effort that it takes to cultivate our relationship with you and uh, value it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.